As far as Unsung Heroes goes as a series, this is probably one of those cars that quite a few of you guys will think, wait a second, I recognise that. That's not exactly Unsung, it was in Colin McRae Dirt. That's true, it was featured therein, not too surprisingly given the name of the car, and of course it was featured, I believe a couple of times actually, at the Goodwood Festival of Speed as well. And that was actually the first time that I was introduced to the car in person when I saw one there myself. And chances are, if I can find it, I'll probably use my own image from Goodwood as the first image of the car in this video. Now, for those who don't know the backstory, why am I filing this under the Unsung Heroes category? What's so special about the car? Or is it like some of the occasions that we've looked at where it doesn't necessarily have to do anything too radical, it's just a car that deserves more attention? Because we do sometimes consider cars like that as well. The Lister LMP, the Morgan GTN, vehicles like that. Well, I would say that this one is a combination of both. Because yes, it does definitely deserve to be talked about more, but at the same time, it's an interesting idea, an interesting concept, and one which, just like the Rondo from last week, and a couple of others too, in fact a couple that doubtless we'll look at in the future as well, it has tragedy in there as well. But unlike Rondo from last week, chances are you probably already know the tragedy involved here, whereas with Rondo, not so many people did. And of course that tragedy was the death of Colin McRae years ago now. Of course, not even related to motorsport, he was in a helicopter. But it's still directly related to this car, to this day, in fact. Now, the idea behind this car actually stemmed way back in 2004, when Colin McRae was visiting DJM Motorsport to have some work done on his Mark II Ford Escort. And he was talking to them, just chatting informally about some of the issues that he had with rallying. For instance, how licensing with a particular team or having a contract with a particular team can sometimes cause friction if you drive a different car. For instance, in your own time or in a different kind of motorsport or at an event or something. For understandable reasons, that can kind of clash with the manufacturer. However, it's a constant issue as well as a side point that he was also discussing that the development costs and the running costs of rally cars are always an issue. If you want to change something, it's always expensive. If you want to redesign something or change a car's essential idea or method of competition, it's going to cost an arm and a leg. And of course, rules are being added and taken away all the time in multiple forms of motorsport for that exact reason, to make things more efficient, more streamlined. Yes, to make cars faster and safer too, but also to cut development and running costs for teams big and small. And of course, even now, we're currently in the throes of seeing those changes happen again in Le Mans with the hypercar classes, which could be coming fairly soon, in fact. But as far as this car goes, contrary to what you might assume, given the name, the Colin McRae R4, technically the McRae R4, you'd probably assume that it was his idea and that he, to some degree, designed the car. That's kind of true and false at the same time, because the car was actually already around before he even saw it, but he did help develop it into something new and bigger and better than it originally was, because DJM Motorsport had built what was, I don't believe at the time, called an R4, but I may be wrong about that, but they basically developed a Ford KA, which is what this car is underneath from a design perspective into this kit car style vehicle and McRae noticed the vehicle and based on this conversation that had been had it piqued his interest. A vehicle which was yes based on this Ford but was so far removed from it that licensing wouldn't be an issue and also if you built it in the right way and designed it in the right way it could be this machine that could be easy to develop well easy to an extent of course I'm using the word easy very loosely but much more cost efficient to develop much more affordable to run and to compete with than a traditional WRC car would be but also potentially a car that could even justify a new category of rally, maybe even one-make racing. And that is where the concept was refined in the case of the R4, because over the course of the next couple of years, up until the end of 2005, when enough parts were made to build the first prototype, DJM Motorsports supported this idea and really went all out with it. Now, as far as the car's construction, some things surprised even McRae himself. For instance, it's a lot lighter than a WRC car. Now, Ford KA, yes, you would assume would be, but a very heavily modified one? Well, surely you're going to add a lot of weight on top. 
but it was still around 300 kilos lighter than McRae's WRC car at the time. That's pretty impressive, because WRC cars aren't exactly heavy to begin with. Now, as far as the body construction and the layout, the car uses, a, of course, a full safety frame, which was one of the most important things to McRae himself. That was forefront on the design. The center section of the car around the cockpit was steel, the front and back end using carbon, which is kind of indicated by the coloration of the car, the red and carbon coloring. And it's available, or would be available, with either two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive options. So a lot of customization there. As far as engines, they had a couple of different options in mind, and one of the ideal ones on the part of DJM Motorsport, the one that they wanted to go with, was around a 2 to 2.5 litre V8 engine, a motorbike-derived V8. But ultimately, they didn't go with that, which was probably a good idea, ultimately, because they wanted to steer away from an engine which was promising, for sure, but could very easily be ruled out under rule changes. So they didn't want to have that issue come up, so they went with a, a rather more conventional but still very competitive 2.5 litre, interestingly, naturally aspirated straight 4 engine, which was actually built by Millington. It's a Millington diamond engine. Now, you're probably thinking, that's a bit strange. Why would you have a naturally aspirated rally car, especially after the year 2000? Well, don't be fooled. It may be naturally aspirated, but it's no slouch. This is a 350 horsepower naturally aspirated engine, which for a two and a half litre straight four is impressive. That's a well-engineered piece of kit. And when you're putting that into a car which potentially only weighs around a thousand kilos, which is one metric ton, that means that your horsepower per ton is very impressive. In fact, beyond a WRC car, even beyond most of today's rally cars in most circumstances, apart from pretty much Pike's Peak. So across the board, it was a healthy car. It certainly looked to be impressive. Production costs were way lower than a WRC would be, far easier to modify and to change if and when necessary. So naturally, they proceeded, and it came time eventually for McRae himself to test the car, so they used a particularly unforgiving stretch of dirt, which they didn't consider to be a good idea, but McRae himself insisted on it, and he tested two cars at once to compare them. He tested the R4, but what he put it up against was a pretty intense opponent, an MG6 R4 which is one of the most iconic rally cars of all time. After a couple of runs, and eventually the rain was too bad to continue, they adjusted some things, the car took a right beating, according to the guys who were there, but ultimately, he came out of that test saying that he thought that the R4 was incredible. And there was no comparison to the 6R4 Metro. It was a superior machine to that icon. Now that is a pretty glowing review from a guy who typically isn't exactly an excitable kind of personality. So this was all looking great. And then they decided to show it to the public, I believe it was for the first time officially, at Goodwood around 2006-2007. But as I said earlier on, I believe they must have taken it more than once, because I saw it, as I said, at Goodwood, and the first time I went was 2009. So it must have been there a couple of times since. It's certainly a car that makes an impression, but it's not the kind of car that makes an impression that, for instance, a Pike's Peak machine would. They have the wow factor and the crazy factor, whereas... There's something about the R4 which is just a little bit different. There's something intriguing about it. It makes you think, what is that? What's its purpose? It looks different to a WRC car. It's smaller, more compact, more purposeful looking with these kind of TVR style headlights around a Ford car shape with these big blistered Group C style or Group B even style arches. It's an intriguing car, and for some reason, and technically it shouldn't because it's not really a rival for it at all, but something about the McRae R4 has always reminded me of the ProDrive P2, as if it's some kind of distant cousin to the idea behind that car. But not really, but I think you probably get what I mean by that. And of course, we looked at that car in this series as well. Now, ultimately, of course, tragedy happened, just like with the Rondeau from last week and various others that we've talked about, and doubtless will in the future. But the death of McRae understandably put a halt to the car's production. It was planned to be put into production, and in fact, there was some pretty heady interest in purchasing the vehicle as well. 
Peter Salzburg, I believe, if I recall correctly, was actually interested in buying one. But, of course, ultimately, it's been a decade. Since then, the McRae R4 is not a purchasable road-legal production vehicle, which was the full intent of it, and that's a shame. It's an understandable shame, but a shame nonetheless. Now, Alison McRae has said that she would be very interested and very open to the car being produced after his death, and you can kind of understand why. It's an appropriate remembrance of him to kind of live on through the games, through this car, and from all indicators, it's a gift of a car, an amazing little machine, which could have not just entered the existing world of rallying, but actually brought something new to it. So as far as I'm concerned, it's definitely an unsung hero. It's not the fastest thing out there, but from what he said, it was pretty good. <laughs> and if a guy like that, like Colin McRae, says that it's good, I'd listen. But that's it overall for this particular pick. Of course, I'll see you guys next time. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.